This exhibit presented in vivid color. It's the Albacete Show, starring the mystical Monsignor, Lorenzo Albacete. Tonight, we invite you to join Lorenzo and his guests, Bob Pollock, Helen Whitney, Sean O'Malley, Christopher West, Angelo Scola, and more. And now, here's Lorenzo. The most fundamental fact is that I can give to you a date before which I did not exist. And rapidly approaching is a date which I think after which perhaps I will not exist. <laughs> so my first and fundamental question is, what's going on? You know, I, I think that's a valid question. I wish I didn't question. I don't know, maybe every, maybe every reality questions it. Maybe dogs and cats are consumed by this problem. <laughs> you know. They don't seem to be. Uh, they don't seem to be. No, I watch a lot of the Discovery Channels and the animal things, <laughs> and they have no evidence <laughs> of wondering what the heck's going on. Okay. But we don't know for sure. No, no, I don't know any. But I ask the question, and I don't see an answer anywhere. In fact, nothing seems to answer it. But the question won't go away. Then I notice that there are certain desires that are inconsistent. I should settle down for what I have. And yet, for example, I want people I love not to die. I want people, I want uh, friendships that are not betrayed. I want uh, justice. I want uh, lie, I don't want to be lied to. You know, there are desires that that seem to make no sense, that, that appear, in fact, to be irrational. And have questions now, all now, So now, now he tells me that these are, you know, ac that accidentally I've evolved these things. Well, it's true that they don't, you know, these desires don't make me reproduce. But, uh, <laughs> what do you know? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is, I admit, a certain uselessness to this in terms of the fact that nothing in the world seems to correspond or answer these desires. Okay, my point, I think all that I ask of myself, and I think it's reasonable to ask of everybody else, is to be faithful to that experience, to that, and, and explore the implications of this. And if something is found that explains it so that this, the question disappears, then fine. That's the end and that's that. Previously on the Abacete Show. 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang happened, where God created light and tons of other awesome stuff like giant stars and killer asteroids and quarks and gravitons. I can't tell you what those last two are, but don't they sound super cool? Most importantly for us humans, the Earth got created. And after things cooled down a bit, God separated the land from the water to form all kinds of spectacularly beautiful places. But the most spectacularly beautifulest of all being, of course, the island of Puerto Rico, which as everyone knows is where the Garden of Eden was located. Next, God filled Puerto Rico and all the lesser places with all kinds of super animals and plants. I'm talking about tons and tons of them. And trust me, a lot of the stuff he made was really, really weird. Then God rested. But not for long, because in 1941, Lorenzo Albacetti arrived on the scene. Wasn't he so incredibly cute? Little Lorenzo asked lots and lots of really deep questions. Like if fish never sleep, can they have dreams? And what was Jesus' favorite dessert? When it was time for Lorenzo to go to college, he biolocated by airplane to Washington, D.C., where he filled his brain with equations like E equals MC cubed times pi the bazillionth power over b minus the square root of infinity and yada 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 and so lorenzo expected to spend the rest of his life launching rockets into outer space conquering planets and winning loads of nobel prizes but then something totally utterly completely unexpected happened and if you want to find out what you'll just have to tune into the next episode of the albacete show Lorenzo Albacete defies any simple description. He reminds me of the Walt Whitman phrase, I am large, I contain multitudes. He was full of joy, smiling, but in that 
presentation of this person, you will discover rapidly that this is an unusual human being. As my priest, he in many ways allowed my heart to flow. He was personal friends with John Paul II. The sense that you always had was that he was really not just teaching us from a book, from a philosophy that he'd learned or a theology he'd learned, but he was teaching out of an experience of friendship. I read Lorenzo's book and I said, I gotta meet this guy. He was a total sign of contradiction. I remember him walking in with a cigarette in one hand and a piece of pizza in the other. And I just thought, oh, this is gonna be quite a ride. And it was. I think he took the time for everybody, this exquisite tenderness. He had this unique ability to speak to the believers and the unbelievers and all shades of gray in between. I remember thinking he was the most exaggerated Puerto Rican I ever met. Um, as a people, we are we process things in laughter, and he was a genius at that. <laughs> uh, we sing when we suffer, we dance when we suffer, um, we enjoy life, uh, and he was like exaggerated in all of these aspects. We are super attentive to the weather the hurricanes he was super paranoid about it we are wanted wanting to be our own individuals he was just a hundred percent himself all of the time <laughs> and so we take joy in being different lorenzo he had a profound love with his native country he had a, a profound identity with puerto rico and that he was a man who would have chosen probably to die in Puerto Rico, just simply out of love for his motherland. His personality was so rooted in our history and who we are as a people. His passion for culture came from how deeply into his own culture he was. He, he appreciated who everyone else was because he could only be himself. He, he was someone who will treasure the human person. And in his walk through life, uh, he definitely he encountered another person. I am from a native of Puerto Rico, and I uh, grew up in a Latin American Catholic atmosphere. 
Faith was never questioned. Um, we uh, baptize anything that moves. <laughs> and then have lots of celebrations and everything. I, I never found any conflict I, uh, with my, my view of, of life uh, and the proposals of the faith. I, I never experienced it. Until I, uh, my beginning of my work as a scientist, at a laboratory in the Washington area, friends of mine that I absolutely admired and wanted peers of, of my work, that I wanted them to accept me, to, to guide me even. I was a beginner in scientific research. Uh, and uh, apparently I was not doing too badly when finally one of them, and I remember it as if it was yesterday, said to me, how can you claim to be a Catholic, a Christian, a believer, for that matter, and, and be a good scientist? He said, what kind of, who is the true you? You come in here during the weekend, and there's no difference between you and, and us. We accept you, you accept us, we are excited together, we follow the rules of scientific research today, and, and, and you're totally indistinguishable from any of us and a good addition to our group. I mean, I felt very grateful for that. But then you walk out of here, and on Sundays or whatever, suddenly you claim that a dead man stopped being dead. I mean, how can you, are you the same person? How can, can those two convictions coexist? If you don't let them mix, then you live two lives. Well, you know, the question in a sense hit home. I had never asked it of myself. I did not experience myself as living two lives. Uh, I, I thought it deserved an answer. It deserved an answer to them, but it deserved an answer to me because now the question had surfaced inside of me. I was a young brother, uh, a Capuchin brother, uh, studying in the seminary. Uh, I began to work with the Hispanic immigrants in, uh, in Washington, particularly at the Cathedral of St. Matthews. And we had English classes there and a number of other activities. Uh, and uh, Lorenzo was... Uh, sort of a parishioner at the cathedral. Uh, we had a lot of mutual friends and, and we, uh, we met then. That would have been in the late 60s, actually. Uh, so a long time ago. <laughs> we became fast friends. At St. Matthew's, there was a, uh, of course, always the challenge finding parking in downtown Washington. And so they had a small parking lot for the priest and there was one place reserved for the Cardinal and Lorenzo uh, parked there one night when he was going to some activity at the cathedral. And lo and behold, as soon as he parked the car, the, the Cardinal's car pulled up right behind him and the Cardinal got out and Cardinal Old Boyle was a wonderful man, but he was sort of a curmudgeon. He went over to the window, taps on the window, and he says to Lorenzo, who are you? And Lorenzo says, I'm the Cardinal. And Cardinal Well says, I'm the Cardinal. And Lorenzo says, yes, you're the daytime Cardinal. He says, but I'm the nighttime Cardinal. And that was the beginning of a, a fast friendship with uh, Cardinal Boyle, who put him into the seminary. He was at Theological College, which was right down the street from the monastery where I lived. So uh, Lorenzo would often come at night and we'd drink coffee late and solve all the problems of the world. And later on, when he was ordained, he asked me to preach at his first Mass. And uh, it was such a joy to 
to see him ordained a priest and knowing all the talents that God had given him was now at the service of spreading the gospel and bringing the joy of the gospel to, to our church. Lorenzo liked to joke around a lot, and, uh, uh, and I, I, I fear sometimes Cardinal Hickey didn't understand that he didn't have the same, uh, <laughs> and very early on when Hickey arrived, he announced that he was putting in a special phone for priests to call if they had any problems. Lorenzo, the first day, calls in and says, oh, uh, your Excellency, I'm having trouble finding my car keys. Would you be able to help me with this? <laughs> and the Archbishop said, what is wrong with this man? I said, he's only joking. <laughs> March 23, 2001. Dear Don Giussani, When I last saw you in November of last year, I told you that from the very beginning of my life as a priest, I was looking for the ecclesial context that would serve as the best point of departure and home for my priestly vocation, indeed my human vocation, and to allow me to respond to the different experiences that had brought me to the recognition of my call. My bishop at the time, William Cardinal Baum, also shared my desire to be with others who shared our conviction about what was lacking in the way the church was pursuing its mission, and together we conceived of certain projects that seemed capable of leading to the desired situation. However, none of them generated any fruits. His style, his way of approaching things always spoke of his relationship with someone he knew. He knew that this mystery was revealed in Jesus Christ, but it was still a mystery. One time I was in the rectory with him and, you know, he was looking for something to go to a meeting. I was supposed to drive him to the meeting. He couldn't find what he was looking for. And this is in his room and of course his room was completely disheveled and you know not very well organized and so i was like oh my god how are we going to find this and so i said just kind of off the cuff it was kind of a personal thing you know i was like oh let's ask saint anthony and he was like, so lorenzo at that point goes nuts i mean it was like no don't no don't mention his name i was like well who did i say he was like he said he did not he was looking at me he said he did not talk to you. He did not mention you. He looks to me and he says, St. Anthony hates me. We will never find this now. If you, And it just struck me that I had never, you know, it was kind of like a common pious thing that you would say, <laughs> you know, let's ask St. Anthony. But to him, these re these were real relationships and they were relationships that kind of spun in different directions at different times. This one who knows Jesus Christ in his own way and in a personal way can also help you to do that. And so it was a unique, for me anyway, a unique and very personal and very intimate way to understand how the saints engage. We know, we, we never found the document, by the way, so it was... <laughs> When he came to Washington to give his talk at Catholic U and visit people here, he stayed at the house of Cardinal Baum, my boss. 
And the Cardinal asked me, since uh, he knew Cardinal Wojtyła was a scholar and intellectual and interested in, in these things, he asked me to be around and to, for conversation purposes, etc. Mm. And, and that's what I did. He was dressed in a black cassock, and there was nothing, no great claim to fame. Uh, but before one would even talk about his ideas, I, I was uh, aware of a great, uh, that you were in the presence of, of a man uh, with almost capital M. There is in him a great uh, authority, but in the good sense of the word, not a, not a frightening one, a great weight of presence and intensity of a, you know that this man has a very intense inner life. We talked uh, extensively about all kinds of, first of all I asked him what he was studying and what he was going to talk about and that led to uh, all kinds of mutual interest in philosophy and theology and uh, he had, we had departed with the understanding that I would write, that I would continue the uh, uh, the dialogue we had had here, that I would become more familiar with some of references, sources he had given me, and, and I never did. I never wrote again. You know, I went in and said, uh, Holy Father, well, what can I say? And he said, well, I'll bet you'll write now. watching the Alba Sete show. What made the most impression on me was his person. He was a man who was free. And I was, I was 25, 26 at the time. I was bound up by so many fears, by so many hangups. And there's this man who had had some encounter with a love uh, that he just called the mystery that had truly changed his life and liberated him. And I said, whatever that man has, I need it. He was such a presence in the classroom. He never just taught. He always brought himself and a very profound, uh, personal, lived experience that was always coming through everything that he taught. So that was that that I mean, so that that was more moving, I think, than than a lot of lectures. Would. I remember one moment in the classroom where on one drag of his cigarette, as if he again was inhaling almost the whole thing, he, he was he, he had begun by saying the scandal of the hick. The scandal of the hick. And I, I thought, what is he talking about? The scandal of the hick. And of course, anybody who knows Albacete's teaching, he was about to give us a profound meditation on the mystery of the incarnation. And the fact that at the, the Basilica of the Annunciation, which I just visited uh, nine months ago in the Holy Land, is a plaque on an altar that has the familiar, the word was made flesh, except here we have the word hick. The word was made flesh here. And what began humorously with the inhale of the cigarette and this curiosity about the scandal of the hick became, a, as I said, a profound, meditation on the mystery of the incarnation, which utterly captivated and fascinated this man, and in turn, anyone in that classroom who was paying attention and willing to go on the journey that Albacete wanted to take us on, he had us enthralled. 
And I have been reflecting on that scene that, you know, the cigarette, the scandal of the hick and how he set the whole thing up. I have been reflecting on that scene in the classroom for 25 years. He would, he would say something that, that would rock your world, but then you'd be thinking, I want to know more. What is this all about? And of course, the, the way his very personal presence just drew you in, you know, you'd be very riveted by everything he said. Um, and so I just, you know, that, that every, every, every encounter I had with him was like that, I would say, like every personal encounter had that quality to it, you know, of, of, of just being, like I said, scandalized or shocked or rocked, but also, um, attracted, drawn, magnetized, you know, by his presence. So that, 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 that was consistent through the whole time I was a student. <laughs> In, in Albacete's mind, there was no difference. Uh, well, let me say it this way. There was a distinction between the sacred and the secular, but not a division. They were wed for him. And again, that flows right out of his lifelong ponderings and entering into and living out the reality of the incarnation. So it was it was that proposal and and just that Monsignor was always proposing things like that. You know, he was always, he's always just bringing forward the absolute truth of the situation, you know, the, the reality of the situation. And, um, you know, we couldn't, we, as students, we couldn't retreat into our own version of what Catholicism was. It was more a question of really coming face to face with the reality. And so that was really, that was a huge, I would say it was, it, it, it was such a huge experience that I can distinctly remember sitting in his classroom. I can remember where I was sitting right next to the window, second row on the left side and being so struck by the manner of his teaching that I said to myself, I know now why I came to here to study. It was so I could be in this class right now, listening to this man. It was very, it was very dramatic for me at the time. And now a word from the mystical Monsignor. Today's word is mystery. Can you tell us in your native speech why they call you the mystical monsignor? Me llaman el, el, el monsignor místico porque a mí, a mí siempre me ha interesado, me ha fascinado el concepto del misterio. ¿Por qué? Porque quiero, hay algo detrás de las apariencias. Yo quiero saber, algo me llama. ¿Dónde ¿Qué es hay el detrás? Misterio? Precisamente ese es el problema, que lo busco y no puedo localizarlo en una manera definitiva. Uh -huh. Lo puedo empezar, a, está aquí, este es el, esto contiene el secreto, pero obviamente no. Va a ir más allá, más allá. Esa búsqueda me inquieta. It was about 6 p.m. Because I remember this because it was right after dinner. I didn't have any appointments yet because I was still newly ordained, so you had a little free time. And uh, I, uh, I started look, clicking on his name and article after article and then YouTube after YouTube. It was about three or four in the morning when I got to bed after I was binging on uh, Albacete. And uh, I remember deep in my heart just saying, finally. Like, I finally found someone who could say things that I was feeling and intuiting, but I was, I was certainly never going to be smart enough to articulate the things the way he was, but I at least knew what he was saying is what my hesitation had always been in my theological studies. And so I just knew right away, uh, I somehow have to stay close to him and, oh crap, what am I going to do now? The guy's dead. <laughs> Lorenzo's here in the presence of Benedict XVI, you know, the most exquisite of pontiffs in every way of being. 
And here was Lorenzo there with the Holy Father. Half of his face was shaven. You know, his coat was covered with whatever he had eaten that morning and three weeks before. And he was completely at ease. I mean, that's our Catholic faith. And this is, and this is who Lorenzo was. This is who Lorenzo was. The, you know, the, Jesus is not afraid of any of that stuff. And Lorenzo wasn't afraid of any of it either. And I think in loving Lorenzo and being in friendship with Lorenzo, it, it should teach us not to be afraid of those things either. Every single one of us entering into these retreats because of Loren Lorenzo, um, because it had something to say to us about our lives, you know, and, and not, they were, of course, they were hilarious and fun and beautiful these retreats, um, but to see him and his, not only him thinking through everything and praying about it and laying out everything in front of you, but his, how much he loved these priests, he loved being with us, um, sitting outside smoking and just hanging out forever, you know, as just to talk, just to hang out and talk for these guys. This was a man who I believe was so in touch with his own humanity and like every humanity, you know, broken, wounded, problematic, and everything like that, that he was able to attend to other people in their moments of brokenness, of woundedness, of, of suffering. He, he really did have that exquisite tenderness I saw it offered to me. That's, the, that's always the hiding, is somehow my humanity is going to get in the way. And uh, he was given some grace at some point where he just knew from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes that... My humanity ain't an obstacle to anything, because if God became flesh, then this is how it's going to get to you. Sorry. And that was it. And then uh, and by doing that, he gave you permission to say, well, crap, if that's the way Lorenzo is, I'm not Lorenzo. I'm Ryan. But I guess I got to be Ryan. Then if that's how God's going to come into the world, uh, I guess I got to figure that out. Then I got to I have to I have to wrestle with the fact that I am part of the equation of God entering the world. And uh Lorenzo was fine with that. He didn't need to have the answer. He just was okay with, well, it's coming through me somehow. And I found that to be really a blessing. Everything about him was, can you stay with me? Can you be with me? And you wanted to be there. And when you did, you, like, like Father Ryan was just saying, you then begin to see things in a more beautiful way. And that's why we miss him so much. For the next 10 years, the Institute grew from its humble origins to become one of the most prestigious theological faculties in the USA today. Angelo Scola came frequently from Rome to teach there, and we became close friends. Prior to meeting Angelo, I had been looking for a theological synthesis that would bring together the different areas of the experience that was moving my life and my vocation. And I believed that the Institute was a privileged place for formulating it. Now, I knew it wasn't enough. There had to be more than the formulation of an adequate theological understanding. Angelo recognized what I needed and arranged my first meeting with you in Milan. For me, it's not una amicizia molto molto grande dopo cena andavamo abbastanza di frequenti in una delle chiese di Washington cui c'era l'adorazione perpetua per pregare un po' eh, ognuno per, per conto proprio io andavo un po' un po' forzato ma lui ci, ci teneva molto insomma trovava sempre il modo per, per trascinarmi there was something about him that I had never seen in a priest. Being interested in and embracing everything that was good, interesting, and, uh, and, and to do so freely. So I asked him, I said, how come you are like that? Uh, and how come you think like that? And he said, well, you see, uh, I was educated uh, by this one, Signor Luigi Giussani. And, uh, well, and who's he? And then he gave me his name, told me the story, movement, etc. But then that was a foreign, strange thing to me. But fine, that was that. Every time that he acted this way, I asked him the same question, and always the same damn Giussani kept coming up. Fin dall'inizio, fin da inizio prima, che lui eh, 
eh, mi, mi dicesse appunto quella volta lì eh, perché citi sempre Don Giussani, perché dici questo, perché dici quello, io anche un po' stufo gli disse ma tu a parlare con Don Giussani. Only that scola wasn't there, he had framed us, he had set us up, he put the two of us together and he never intended to be there. So Giussani was thinking what the heck is this guy here for? And I was thinking what do I say to him? You know, hi, I like your books. Uh, you autograph this. E quindi ho creduto che, che l'incontro diretto fosse realmente importante per lui e magari avevo anche pensato per il movimento negli Stati Uniti. And, uh, and at the end uh, of this long uh, conversation, he had asked me for help to, for the movement in the United States. And uh, I uh, agreed, and so when I got back to the United States, I began to be more involved uh, in certain of the activities of the movement. Never did I think myself part of it. Through being with these people and, and living life uh, with them and doing these gestures with them, that the theological synthesis I had worked together had become a life, something concrete. Uh, a real life, an experience of life, and not just a thought. Raramente un intellettuale si, si sposta uh, fino lì, mm. a, a un'età relativamente matura, avanzata certo. della, della, della sua vita. Quindi, secondo me, è proprio uh, il, il concetto di esperienza, eh, o meglio, il metodo del partire dall'esperienza. At the end of tonight's episode, we will reveal the contents of this never-before-seen secret mystery tape in which Lorenzo Albacete reveals the answer to a question that has remained unanswered for more than 60 million years. Stay tuned to The Albacete Show. Seppi che si era liberata la, il rettorato di Porto Rico e allora dissi a, a Givice al Papa che al Bassetti poteva andare bene rischiando molto, sapevo di rischiare, solo che avevano già scelto il nuovo rettore, ma nonostante questo il Papa ultimamente cambiò, disse via questo sì. qui e vada al Bassetti. conversations were just terrific you know here this small university the, the goals the sensibility of making it kind of the meeting place of both north and south america and the studies that were going on it was great expectations I mean, it was just great fun he would have been a wonderful president except that the bishops in the island they got nervous because it was so creative and so different, you know, that uh, they just didn't know how to take it. How could they miss what was being given to them? How could they not see the, the potential for what was possible? E, e lì lui entrò, entrò con la sua personalità, con tutti i vescovi contro per questa operazione, con disordine nell'amministrazione finanziaria, soprattutto fece come prima cosa la sistemazione di un appartamento regale per sé. We call him Lorenzo the Brief, no, because he only lasted nine months his presidency. For the last nine years, I was the president of the Board of Trustees of the Pontifical Catholic University in Ponce. That was uh, from the year 2011 until uh, last uh, August last year. And I was able to understand and realize that the reason uh, Lorenzo was ousted out of the university 
by the Board of Trustees, but by the Grand Chancellor, the Bishop of Ponce, and other bishops in Puerto Rico, it was because he started to encounter, to find difficulties with the, the way the business of the university was being conducted. I have asked uh, the university to research the tenure of uh, Lorenzo at the University of Ponce, but one thing I'm pretty sure of, and I'm convinced of before the Lord, Lorenzo did what had to be done. The church in Ponce, involved with the university, was so embroiled in difficulties that they didn't want Lorenzo to resolve them. Lorenzo was so generous, so noble in his, in his soul, the nobility of Lorenzo to resign gently without giving any scandal. To me, it was a, an incredible example of Christian love, of ca the capacity to live with others in the church. I've described him as this brilliant missionary uh, to the secular world. It's no small thing to be able to, to, to do that, to be that in this, in the midst of modernity. So we had the same, not the same language so much as the same presumption of the necessity of being clear about what we don't know. And that's what brought us together in a very serious, ongoing way, so that I am still talking to Lorenzo in my head sometimes. He always said to me, you know, Helen, I get up and have to fight every morning about what it is that I believe. Validation never completely ends, even for a Monsignor. But I guess what I'm saying is that soulful, hard to describe question of what is of ultimate value in your life was one that came up with, 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 with Lorenzo in ways that it rarely does with other very close friends. And so, as I was saying, friendship with, with Lorenzo, there was so much food on the plate, so many, so many different meals. And he seemed, and I, with him, to touch all those bases. That is Lorenzo's legacy. It is the absolute transferable, non-judgmental, available possibility of the love that Amy and I felt in your house, the love that I felt hanging out with Lorenzo. It is safe love. And that's his legacy to me. It was also funny. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a seeker. I, never, I haven't found my faith, but he always gave me hope that I one day would. And as I said, he helped me doubt my doubt. And I think he did that for so many people. It seems like the people who had the opportunity to know Jesus when he walked on the earth have a decided advantage over all of us, just because they had the opportunity to actually see him physically and to ask him questions and to hear what he had to say and just to experience his physical presence. And I was wondering how we can come to an experience that approximates that, but without expecting to have Christ physically in front of us, because somehow we have to do that. It is no more difficult today to recognize Christ than it was when he walked around. There are many who saw him, many who heard him, many who touched him. They crucified him. They killed him. They hated him. How come? They didn't see this exceptionality. They didn't experience this attraction. The only person, I think, in the entire Bible who claims to have lived a perfect moral life is that young man who came to Jesus 
and said that he had fulfilled all the commandments. The only one. Maybe he had only three. <laughs> I have violated them all except murder, and that's because I am a coward, not because I'm good. If I haven't done it, I've done it in my mind. This guy says he has fulfilled them all. And you know, he wasn't lying. Jesus looked at him with love. It's only one more step. Give up everything and follow me. Follow me. It's not enough to have fulfilled. Follow. And he didn't. He saw. He was looked at. He experienced actual physical contact. And he didn't follow him. No, no. They didn't have any greater advantage than we do. In both cases, whether then or now, the obstacle, the scandal, is that we really cannot imagine that the mystery has become flesh, has become a human reality, and meets me, therefore, through human realities. Not just with your heart. You need to see something with your eyes, something human. You need to hear a human voice, to feel a human hand, to look and be looked at with human eyes. But when it happens, we are scandalized by its humanity. Humanity means humanity. Coming back to New York from a trip, we flew over the city, and all I could think of was that down there was my family, and that you were our father, and that the movement was indeed the answer to my lifelong quest. Finally, I had come home. Before uh, encountering Albacete, Yusani was speaking about the uh, U.S., about American mission. But uh, Albacete was the incarnation of this possibility. Uh, and I think that what Albacete suggested is not the past, it's the future. We didn't know exactly what, what was happening and, and what was going to happen. But as the adventure went by, uh, I saw that, how can I put it? That was becoming Lorenzo's flesh. I mean, in giving himself and in sharing his love for Father Giussani, he received the hundredfold. You need a culture able to, 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 te to take inside everyone. Lorenzo is this position, also because he went from Puerto Rico, he was a, a scientist, he was a priest. He's an example in his, in his life of this possible connection between different parts of American people. It seemed that he had been taken a little bit too early. Um, and so in order to, um, to make sure that future generations had the opportunity to experience the uh, same person that we had, um, we, we decided to, to form a, a way in which that could be done. And so the Albacete Forum was created out of that desire to continue uh, sharing Monsignor's legacy with the world. collecting everything that we had of him from uh, hand scribbled notes on napkins that were written on his way to important speeches, um, notes, email correspondence, uh, talks he had given, little bits that had been recorded here and there, uh, to the pens that he bought all over the country and the world uh, and collected by, quite frankly, the thousands. Um, and, and to form an archive, first and foremost, and then to use that archive in a way that would continue to offer uh, Monsignor Abbasetta's um, thoughts and, and what had never been published by him with people who had not yet encountered him or, or for those people who had encountered him as a way to go even deeper into knowledge of him. 
And this became uh, a work and we wanted to share this both in public forums and uh, and with the publication of books. When it was the moment to leave, uh, <clears throat> um, Albacete uh, greeted him, uh, kind of embracing him, and then he left. So then it was my turn to, to greet uh, Father Giussani. And uh, I went there to embrace him. And Father Giussani said, uh, looking at uh, Monsignor who was just uh, leaving, he said, uh, I say it in Italian first, uh, dobbiamo dare tutto per quest'uomo. <clears throat> we have to give everything for this man. It's been a great honor and pleasure for me to be working on a collection of Lorenzo Albacete's writings called The Relevance of the Stars, published by Slant Books, the literary imprint that I edit. And it's a book that I think has been one that many people have been longing to see. People have understood that he was a real thinker. And um, this collection brings together a wide range of his most thoughtful pieces um, that are both grounded in deep theological ideas, but also with his classic ability to communicate with humor, with concreteness, um, and with a certain level of mischief and fun. After Monsignor died, there was a ton of material that he created in all different formats, a lot of it not in digital format, that we collected and we've put together in an online archive. The Relevance of the Stars is really the fruit of going through the archive, taking some of these gems, putting them together in a single volume. One of the things that I really love about The Relevance of the Stars is the way that it synthesizes the thought of Luigi Giussani, the founder of Community Liberation and Pope's John Paul II and Benedict XVI. And then the second half of the book really applies these insights to a variety of issues, how Christians engage culture, um, how the professions can be pursued in ways that follow the common good and so there are essays on law and medicine, university teaching, youth. Uh, there's a tremendous breadth there, but there's a unifying vision at the heart of it that really ties everything together in a powerful way. The stars represent the desire for the infinite of the human heart. And the proposal that Monsignor makes is that it's only by living for, the, for those infinite desires that we're, go, we're ever going to get anywhere in life, right? So we have to get to the bottom of that. Our desire, our hunger for truth and for beauty and for goodness and justice um, really do shape everything that we see, the whole world. And uh, that goes right down to the things that we're tempted to think of as mundane, but the, how we live, how we, how we eat, how we uh, hang out with each other. And Albacete gives that an intellectual grounding that's very, very accessible and, and readable. How do we live according to those desires in a society which is on the face of it entirely divided, right? That's what we've experienced this year is this huge division in our culture between different camps, ideologies, different approaches, different parties. And I think that what Monsignor Albacete does in this book is he gives us a starting point for understanding the division and getting to the and healing it, getting to the bottom of how we could heal that. And now we reveal the never before seen contents of this secret mystery tape in which Lorenzo Albacete reveals the answer to a question that has remained unanswered for more than 60 million years.
absolutely useless, like crazy things. Things that are, in fact, somewhat embarrassing. When you were not in love, you know? You say, how could I ever have gone in so silly? And you do crazy stuff like that. Well, that's you. Imagine absolute infinite love. You know? I have a friend of mine who's a priest of the Archbishop now, and we were a few years ago on this back home I'm from Puerto Rico. And in the south coast, there are these little mangroves. They're like little islands that don't have, that they don't have sand. They have like the roots of the tree out of the ground. I mean, but they are all hundreds of trees with the mixed roots. They kind of like just float in the ocean. <laughs> and you go through little channels, you know, you take a little boat and go through channels of tons of these. It looks like, you know, you're in Miami Vice or something. And, it's just like, <laughs> and you go through them and, you know, I, I, we took you for a ride. And you see the weirdest little silly stupid animals, like crabs this big, little crabs, little, thing, little fishes that jump, and you see it. I mean, no human being has ever seen those crabs. Uh, I mean, the particular one. No one will ever see it again. They are born, they die. They live, they die. And you, go, and you say, you know, what's going on? I mean, 90% of the time, these creatures are invisible. I, I said today, I watched the Discovery Channel. One of the things I love is when they go down to depths that no one has ever gone before and see these weird life forms so of them so incredibly awesome and beautiful. And yet, there was nobody there prior to them to see them, you know. Why are they there? So, and I said that to, to Father Vincent Spies, because he was just, he said, you know, I was just thinking, all creation, he said, everything that exists, the Bible says, is for Christ, and it is a gift to him, including ourselves, from his Father. You know, the Father must really be completely and crazily in love with his Son, because he's just given him too much. He can't stop creating strange, new, different things, just to, as a gift. And I remember that I knew my father, I was an only son for many years, <coughs> my brother came along and ruined it all. <laughs> and I used to take advantage of my, of my father, who thought, you know, that I was like making success of my, I, he had me, he was an older person, which I don't think he expected to have a kid. And then I was just so beautiful. And I was kind of thin and blonde. It's just kind of like this, the hair. Was like, I, I was just so incredibly cute. And, uh, and played it up, you know. And at Christmas time, I could hear him discussing with my mother. I wonder if we got him enough presents. Oh, this is a chance. So I would go look around and he said, Say, Daddy. And then he would go out to buy presents. My mother said, Can't you see he's doing this to you? Because he wants presents. He already has enough. I mean, he's lying. I'm like, Impossible. I was. She was right. I hated him. Because she could tell that I was lying. But he could. I, I really manipulated this man till I got stuff that I really didn't even want it or need. I know that if I put the right phrase on, he would just go out and, and spend every penny he had, he wasn't a rich man, in buying all kinds of things. And, and I think that's my father. Can you imagine the eternal father, the eternal son, giving him presents? That's the reason why there are dynasties. It's exaggeration in creation. Matter, anti-matter, black holes, nobody knows what, what's there. Creatures, beings of all kinds. So it's, it's completely outrageously out of control. What does it tell you? It tells you that behind all of this is an infinite love gone crazy. So I, I'm not lying to you. I very seriously tell you, I mean, as serious as I can, that I would not find it strange if the only reason there are dinosaurs is to make no one happy. Next time on the Alba Sete Show. Slant Books announced the release of the Apple Set the Exercise Guide, and the pages are all blank. 
Then Lorenzo tries yet again to win over St. Anthony by hiring a mariachi band to play on his feast day. Only they accidentally play a hymn to St. Ludwina, the patron saint of ice skaters, so St. Anthony is more annoyed with Lorenzo than ever. And the Albacete Forum is overwhelmed as they try to archive the 17,862,443 pens that Lorenzo accumulated over his lifetime. Oh, wait, they just found two more. So make that 17,862,445. Or maybe more. That's next time on the Albacete Show.